Hi, good morning. It's Mark Owen from Move Smarts, PR, the editor of Punchline magazine. Welcome to Punchline Talks. This morning on Business Breakfast Brief is a fantastic panel from across the, the whole spectrum of the different business communities. We've got Mark Begg, a manager director of Siren Sister Fabrica Fabrication Services. We've got Councillor Dawn Melvin, the cabinet member for Economic Recovery for Growth of Gloss. We've got Joe Roberts from very well known partner at uh, Roberts. Uh, Roberts Limbrick, uh, Architects, and we've got John Workman, Senior Partner at BPE Solicitors. Good morning, guys. Thanks ever so much for joining us. I'm looking forward to seeing what your news views. Uh, well, what's going on in the national newspapers? John, let's start with you, please, sir. What have you picked out for us? Well, uh, uh, the, yeah, oddly, I'm going to talk about COVID because apparently it's in the news quite a lot. Um, the, uh, the, the front page of the Times, um, Whitehall sources predict all over 50s vaccinated by end of March. Wow. Um, which is, um, yeah, it, it is clearly um, huge. Um, I know we've all been reading about it, we've been listening to the news, uh, and um, I'm, I'm sadly some of us have experienced it in a, in a more personal way. Um, but the, um, yeah, yeah, if that is true, um, and it feeds into various other sort of strands of news this week. Um, the first time the government is, is actually under-promising and over-delivering on this crisis, which would be a, uh, a, a welcome change. Um, but, you know, first of all, it means we are um, likely to see um, restrictions you know, coming, falling away pretty quickly um, um, uh, spring, uh, in the in the early late spring, and I think if it, I think that's you know, that is the answer to nearly every other problem, um, as we all know. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so that that that's yeah that, that that will be fantastic. And obviously, personal interest since I'm 61, um, be quite pleased if it's true. And, um, we might all make it, apart from the dawn. Uh, I'm a lot older than you think I am. Well, <laughs> I've, played it, I've played it safe, Dawn. It's played but, it safe. But thank you very much. I really appreciate it. John, have you got another story there that you've got there in the bag? Well, do you know what? The, um, although um, COVID is yeah, clearly massively, massively important um, to the world in general, um, I think what's happening in America is actually more important historically um, and will be seen to be more important um, um, you know, for, for, for years to come. Um, the the, the 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 utter degradation of um, Trump's actions last week and the response to that are either the beginning of the new American civil war or or or, or hopefully um, you know the the, the 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 beginning of the end of a, of a an aberration but it's um, yeah it is it's, it's extremely worrying that it happened at all and what it tells us about America um, interestingly um, I, I actually bought the Times yesterday. And I don't know if you can see this. I mean, so the screen's not brilliant, but um, that is a picture of the National Guard, uh, obviously resting in that case, um, in the Capitol building um, underneath the statue of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, yeah, the guy, the, yeah, the guy who fought the Civil War, the guy who was assassinated for winning it. And that you could hardly make it more poignant about what's happening in America and what's, you know, what's what, what the threat not only to their democracy, but actually to democracy as a whole. Um, uh, it, seems, the, uh, it seems, I don't know if anybody else agrees with me, but it seems that the China are the winner out of all this. You know, the West la la laughing all the way to the bank. They've, yeah. they've along, so, along with the along with the Iranians. They certainly and President are, Putin. So yeah, I mean, uh, uh, again, in the Telegraph the other day, there was a very good article by William Hague, who um, I've had the privilege of meeting, and uh, you know, he's a, an extremely insightful and very widely read um, guy. I mean, whether you think he was a greatest conservative leader or not is, is neither here nor there. Um, um, but the, the threat, the, the, the idea that democracy will prevail is actually under threat. So I, I think it's the most, one of the most dangerous times in history since the Second World mm. War. Let's move I on. Think, Thanks, um, very much. Thanks very much, John. So, um, Joe, let's, let's go to you next, if that's OK. So what stories have you picked up? Well, there's no updates on potholes, was the first thing I was going to say, unfortunately, after the last time I was on. But I did find one. Um, and it was good, it's sort of good news COVID story, really, um, which, you know, we all need at the moment in this, uh, these current times. And it was the fact that um, after year on year rises, burglaries are actually down. So the good news is that we're all being told to stay at home and at least one part of the workforce are staying at home. Uh, <laughs> it's burglars. So a very classy headline uh, in the papers this morning. 
Oh, hang on, bear with me. Which is uh, Blue Stop <laughs> Scumbags, which I thought was great, high quality. Um, but the good news is a 7% drop in burglaries uh, in 2020 from 2019. Um, so it kind of shows that those guys are staying at home. But And I guess it brings us on to the bigger challenge for business owners um, at the moment and, and those running businesses in that, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's been a change. And I think the government have been very uh, quick to criticise people going back to work um, and businesses not necessarily closing. But the wording, you know, we've changed from key worker to essential worker. And, you know, we do a lot of work with schools um, all over the place. And I was talking to a couple yesterday and, you know, they're, they're two form entry primary schools, so 400 children. And they've currently got 200 children in. Um, so half the school is full. I was expecting, you know, 30, 40 children. So it goes to show there's been a change. And I think the change has been that businesses have been less willing to allow these essential workers to stay at home this time. Um, and, and that's meant that there's a lot more children in the schools right now um, and, and a lot more people out and about. Um, and, I, and I think it's difficult. It's a real challenge, isn't it? You've got to protect your business. Um, you want to protect your people. That, that work with you. And then there's doing the right thing uh, you know, on, on, a, on a larger scale and, and trying to balance those three is, is really tough at the moment, I think. I totally agree with you. You just have to stand on Cold Avenue or any major sort of crossroads and the amount of traffic Going up and down is, is, is phenomenal. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with you, Jeremy. What do, you, what do businesses do? I mean, Mark runs a factory in uh, Siren Sister. Hi, Mark. Good morning. Thanks, morning. For, thanks for joining us. So uh, what, uh, what stories have you picked out this morning for us? Uh, so I have tried to avoid uh, directly relating to COVID, but I don't think you can get away from the pandemic. Um, I've chosen a story from the Telegraph, uh, and it's around uh, online shopping and does it spell the end for the high street? And there's been a lot of talk about uh, the decline of the high street, but in actual fact, and the, and the argument in part of the article is that the high street is continually changing. Um, it's a form of Darwinism in action in that the high street changes to its environment and has been for a number of years. If we date back to the 80s and 90s, the, uh, the big supermarkets sort of came into town, therefore the, the small independent grocers started to disappear uh, through the 90s and the noughties. Um, the internet kicked off and online shopping started. Um, and a lot of the retailers that were on the high street that didn't adapt or didn't put um, an online shop, they suffered. And I think what we've seen in the last year is a, an acceleration of that even more because we're not allowed out of the house. Um, online shopping just exploded even more. You only need to look at the price of Amazon shares this year uh, to, see, to see that. But it's really um, accelerated that. But there's also opportunity in that at the same time. And part of the opportunity in that is if you look at companies like uh, the likes of Greggs or Costa or even Next, um, those companies have actually adapted. They have adapted, they've survived, and they've actually started to expand within this. And there's also opportunity for the likes of, you know, I'll say myself, um, whereby what we're seeing is there is this almost artisan um, renaissance starting to happen whereby People are wanting now to buy more local, to buy things that have been crafted by people within their community, within their district, within, within, their, um, within their council region or whatever it is. And I've had two conversations with customers just in the last two days where they said, we really want to actually give you this business and do business with you because you're a local company. We're a local company. For a start off, they said, we didn't even know you existed down there until, you know, a few months ago, um, which is just wrong from our side, but we can talk more about that at a different discussion. But the fact that they're looking for local businesses to be able to fulfill their orders where they used to go offshore or even go, you know, to to foreign markets or, or just um, just into the next county, they're, they're really sticking local now. That's really 
that's that's fantastic news. Do you just very very quickly because we want to go over to Dawn in a second, but um, what do you want to just very quickly explain what you guys do, Mark? Yeah, no problem. So we are Siren Sister Fabrication Services. Um, we are a metal working shop. We design, fabricate, uh, weld, finish uh, anything out of metal. Um, and the strap line that we've uh, we've incorporated into sort of the new business model is that we turn inspiration into metal. So uh, if you want something built out of metal, chances are uh, we can do it. We do everything from uh, you know architectural steels. So I'm sure I'm going to have a good conversation with Joe here at some stage uh, to um, uh, industrial chic style furniture, um, shelving units, uh, a variety of different things we do. Yeah, I've seen some of the works and it was fantastic. OK, well, thanks very much, Mark. I'm sure we'll come back to you in a second and talk a little bit more about your business. But uh, I'd just like to give Dawn a, a chance to talk about some of the, the new stories that have caught your eye in the national newspapers. Well, I'm... Good morning, Mark. Good morning, boys. I'm feeling a little bit like the English Channel after one of those Dutch super trawlers has been through it. Because um, you boys have scooped up all the stories, so I was fran frantically using my little digit to try and find something else. Um, but the thing I, I'm going to mention is uh, with regard to house prices and property, um, because I think it's quite relevant that Rishi did this um, up to half a million pound stamp duty holiday. Um, and there has been talk about whether he will or won't extend that. Um, but I'm actually in the position um, in a position where I'm trying to sell a house at the moment. Um, and I think it's good news that he brought in this uh, half a million. I'm not sure if it's quite the same in Wales, actually. I think it might be a 250 ceiling there. But it's talking about, you know, um, the Institute of Charter Surveyors are saying, look, come on, Rishi, extend it for a bit longer. It runs out at the end of March. Um, so it seems that people are going to start putting pressure on him. But actually, I think it's the right thing. I'm one of these people that could never really get my hand around stamp duty. Um, so, you know, if you're buying a property, I'm just trying to think of a good example. So let's say property 600,000. The stamp duty on that's about 38 grand, I believe. I'm sure there's a lawyer there that can confirm that. But it, it, it's huge amounts of money. Um, and what do we get for it? Absolutely bugger all. Um, so it's another stealth tax, isn't it? So I think that would be a really fantastic thing. Look forward to that. It's very important from Gloucester's point of view um, that we continue to see um, movement and um, houses selling. And, and contrary to what anyone in Cheltenham believes, um, I can assure you that properties in Gloucester go for quite a bit of money now. I mean, you know, that sort of window where you could come into Gloucester and snatch up a Georgian um, you know, terraced house for 250 grand are well gone. So um, it really does affect our market here. Um, and, you know, obviously you want lots of people to come. That's all about it's helping economic growth. You so, were saying, so Dawn, sorry to stop you, but you, you were saying the other day, actually, that the regeneration and property, commercial property there in Gloucester is being snapped up. Absolutely, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it'll get quoted somewhere at some point. Um, but yes, I had someone who I'd been schmoozing with my, you know, sort of believe, 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 please for the last four and a half years, um, out, although people have been doing it for a lot longer, about bringing his wonderful um, DOSH to Gloucester um, and investing on a sort of very large commercial basis. And um, he rang me and said, right, I'm ready to go. Come on, what have you got? And I said, 67 to 69 London Road. That's it, you've missed the boat, you know. There is so much um, interest in the city at the moment. Obviously, there's smaller stuff. Um, we've got lots of fantastic retailers looking at Gate Streets at the moment because of the reimagining stuff that's going on. But um, the days of being able to whiz in and pick up a large site are gone. I mean, they're just gone. It's a shame because there's some real talent in and around the area um, that would have been lovely to have them as part of the sort of Gloucester family from an investment point of view. But there's just, um, sadly, there's just, it's just not there. No, it's it's fantastic. As you know, I've been involved in regeneration. You have. You've been a massive supporter of the whole. You know, come on. You know, come over here, sort of thing. But yeah, it's exciting. But yeah, that 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 really appealed to me because I thought there's a lot of people out there. Um, whether you sit at this sort of uh, of above the 190 thousand mark or just below the half a million mark, the whole market is affected by this. The whole chain is affected by it. So yeah, I'd love to see Rishi um, carry on. So you're obviously personal friends with him mark so let's hope he's watching this morning and he's gonna yeah. listen 
Well, I hate to say this, I don't want to name drop. I have actually met the last three chancellors and the last I three know, prime ministers. I know but... you have. I've been there with those 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 um, parties that you organise where they come. Yeah. <laughs> there yeah. you go. Thank you, Dawn. I know you've got a big story that we want to talk about uh, as well in a minute about the King's Court because that is moving on. So I'm going to come back to you on that. John, let's go to you, sir. Um, BPE, you seem to be, well, I get a lot of press releases all the time. I'll be honest with you, we've had a whole flood of great deals from BPE. You guys seem to be really, really rocking at the moment on the deals front. Can you tell me the secret to the success or, you know, are you guys just out there really pushing the company? Well, uh, uh, I mean, we are uh, clearly, we are, we are, you know, I, I've said without shame in the past and I repeat it now, you know, we are lawyers, therefore we are parasites and we only reflect um, what the host is doing. Um, um, I suppose symbiotic might be, might be a nice way of saying we are, we are the remora fish to the sharks, but the, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, the, yeah, deal flow is, 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 is pretty strong. Um, yeah, the, I mean, clearly everything stopped dead in the first lockdown because nobody knew what, what to do. Everybody was, uh, was, 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 was going waily waily. Um, but since then, it, uh, in all fairness, um, since certainly May, um, that if people have come back on stream, they're doing deals. Um, I, is some of it driven by the fact there's a fear of um, higher capital gains tax rates um, in the next budget? Yes, some of that would be, but if you haven't started now, you're not going to beat it anyway. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think there's any room for, for, for raising taxes uh, or uh, put, putting brakes on the economy by, 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 by higher taxes in, in, in this budget, maybe, maybe, in the, maybe, maybe the autumn, maybe next year. Um, but that's, I don't think that's driving it. I think what's driving it is people seeing opportunities and um, you know, they've got, they've got the, uh, they, they, they still have to build businesses. They still have to, 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 to drive things forward. Um, you know, they're living with COVID um, as, as an economic fact. Um, and obviously you know, the, there's also the opportunity that, you know, the, 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 um, I think somebody mentioned Darwin earlier. There's the, you know, there's the opportunity for, 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 for those who are faster to adapt is what Darwin actually said. Uh, not the fittest um, to uh, to take up those who didn't. And we have had some um, so, some some work out of the insolvency sector um, or, or near insolvency sector, as well as um, the the more traditional um, buy and build sort of strategies. I mean, it's it's a well known fact. We act for a number of um, uh, public companies, um, and they can still raise money, particularly on AIM, if they want to to fund acquisitions. Um, uh, and, and or further growth, and they're doing that. So it's a mixture of um, regional consolidators uh, and um, AIM companies funded largely through London who are um, out on shopping sprees. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's what's happening and, and well, will continue to happen. Well, it's great, to, it's great to see a local firm doing so 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 well, and congratulations, John, you. you know, pushing, pushing it out as you do. Which you go talk to me about success. That feeds nicely over to Joe, actually, and Joe... Uh, you know, is one of the partners of Robert Lindbricks, one of the best well-known architects in the area. Joe, you seem to be doing very well as well. Run, won a number of awards. We covered it at the December issue of Punchline. Yeah, yeah. No, it, I mean, the, the practice is, um, is really busy at the minute. Um, and interestingly, sort of busy in almost every sector. I say almost because, you know, re retail probably, and, and, and to an extent sort of um, leisure is, is reasonably quiet. But Every other sector is really busy. We're busy as a practice. Um, and as usual, we're kind of heads down. You know, as, as architects, we like to tell ourselves we're tortured, you know, creative artists. But the reality is we're, we're a service industry and we, we provide a service. So we're heads down doing our best to deliver projects um, for our clients. Um, and yeah, and, it, and it's going OK. And it's yes, it's nice to get awards. And we've had some, some really great uh, success on that front. But that's not what we're about as a practice. You know, we're not, I think I've said to you before, we're not a, a coffee table uh, architect. Um, we're about delivering projects for our clients, getting the best value and delivering the best outcomes really on, on every level. But uh, yeah, no, it's, yeah, it, busy, busy times. And the challenge at the minute is uh, how you uh, do something, do a job like we do uh, remotely or as remotely as we can. Are you seeing with your design changes that people want to change their offices as in, you know, with COVID moving forward, uh, you know, are they, are they perhaps not going to go back to the office? There's this, I, I get a, I get a sort of feedback. It's 50, 50 people don't really know what they're doing. You know, 
move, moving well, forward? I mean, what's what's the general gist from, from people coming to you about the future offices? Well, I think it's a great um, uncertain world that we're moving into. I think, you know, Mark just touched on this sort of huge accelerated change um, that COVID sort of brought about. Um, and, and I think it'll take some time for a few things to settle, one, one being the high street and what the future of that looks like. Um, and the other being, in particular, being the workplace. And I think I said last time, so I won't be a stuck record, but, you know, what we are seeing in the workplace is this shift. So if there's a shift to uh, people working remotely, the important thing about the workplace is to create a destination um, because you want people to come back in and collaborate and meet, maybe not every day, um, but to, to, to a point. Um, and we're seeing it now in our practice. I think this has gone on so long that a lot of the, it really starts to challenge your culture as a business. Um, and people are starting to lose the links, the sorts of friendships and the, the camaraderie, because whilst when we could, we, we, had, we encouraged people to come in a bit, they haven't been in in the same way. So the, you know, the, the social element and the, the cultural element is missing. Um, so I think that'll be the big drive for workplaces. How do you get people back in uh, and, and create a, a place that people want to be? Um, yeah, I, was, I, think that's probably I was talking to someone the other day, and uh, what she said to me, which I'm no, I, don't, I, I don't know as a, as a marketing person, and, um, you know, she, uh, she doesn't have a partner, doesn't live with anybody, um, uh, you know, she, she's basically there at home, working from home the whole time, and, and it came across that actually she would be quite lonely. And I, I think this is a, a, a big problem moving forward, actually. You know, I'm, I'm lucky I'm married. I've got kids. We're, we're in, this, in this house. Um, and sometimes I think you're right, that disconnect of the individual workers. I mean, you can work in a, in a massive factory and still be lonely, mind you, you know, or you know, a big building and still not talk to the people around you. But I just feel that, you know, there's this ticking time bomb there. I, I personally feel we've all got to go back to the office, but... That's why I'm hanging on to my fire station for dear life. But uh, anyway, anyway, thanks very much, Joe. We come to you to talk about punchline in a, in a very short time. Mark, I want to go over to you because uh, time is ticking. That's the thing about this program. It goes very, very quick. Mark, you bought your business, Cyrus System Fabrication Services. How long ago was it? Uh, at the end of October. Uh, how did you come? Because you, you're from New Zealand originally. How did you end up in Gloucestershire? Well, I've been in the UK now for just on 20 years, so um, it, it wasn't just um, stumbling in during a pandemic and, and doing anything like that. So I've, I've been involved in a lot of different industries um, in the UK. Uh, I originally trained as a metalsmith uh, in New Zealand, uh, leaving school, so I went and did an apprenticeship. Um, and at the start of the year, I, I was looking at what I was doing. Um, looked at a variety of different industries that uh, I wanted to get involved in. One of them was renewable energies, um, and and how that was um, how that was evolving, and, and we're seeing that a lot more now, even still during the, the pandemic. Um, and through researching some of those uh, 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 renewable energy companies, I actually stumbled across the idea that actually you've you've still got to manufacture things with it and and be able to do it. I couldn't find a renewables energy company that suited me, but I found a fabrication company. And so brought this in October, um, looking at all the facilities of what we can do here today. And a longer term plan is to start going, okay, what else can I bring on top of it or add in? So can we start to fabricate things like um, a shelter that has solar, built-in batteries, built-in electric charging points for your electric bike or whatever, or do it on a bigger scale so it already has the built-in uh, built charger for your car, can we take it down that line in the longer term? Along with everything we're doing today, don't get me wrong, I, I, you know, that we've got a, a long heritage, 35 plus years of fabrication and welding within the area. So I don't want to change that and, and throw that away. That's, that's, that's not what it's about, um, but it's how we can grow. So I found that and, and looked at it. And having done this before, it was very easy for me to see, A, the quality of the work that was going out the door, but B, the major potential that was there because it wasn't being marketed and it wasn't being driven. 
and just actually, um, you know, shaping some of the things that we do and making some noise about it. So, you know, thank you for inviting me on this. It gives me a bit of a platform to, you know, tell people who we are and what we do. Well, no, it's, it's great to have you on, and it's great to have um, you know someone taking on a taking on the business and driving it forward, Mark, in the way that you're doing. So I think it's very very exciting. I've seen some of the products, uh, and I hope other people will have a good look now as well. So, uh, Solid System Fabrication Services. I'm going to quickly go over to Dawn because time is ticking. Thanks, Mark. Go over to Dawn. Dawn. Okay, 107 million pounds. A press release that landed in my uh, inbox very late yesterday for King's Quarter. Can you just tell us about that, please, and, and moving that forward? Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, the first thing I think we need to, to sort of say here is that the regeneration and economic development strategy for the city, um, the sort of dreams of what we were going to achieve between 2016 and 2021 is a public document. So this is something that City Council has. But the amazing thing about that is pretty much everything we said we were going to do is, is been done now. And obviously King's Quarter is part of that. But what a lot of people don't realise is at that point, um, sort of 215 to 216, we'd already had £700 million worth of investment in the city, including, of course, the development that Peel did at the top. Um, but this was driven over the previous decade by a number of people, sort of starting with the Gloucester Heritage Urban Regeneration Company, and then obviously um, the um, Regeneration Advisory Board, which was to do with Stephen Lake and Paul James. And then obviously um, you had Paul James at the City Council, who was Regeneration too. So and we've got an amazing guy doing it now, Richard Cook, which is fabulous. So you've got all these passionate people driving this forward. Um, and the reason that I've given you a bit of background there is it's very easy for... Um, people sort of say now, wow, aren't we clever? Look what we've just delivered. But the reality is there were so many people behind that that worked for that, including the public, by the way, because there was loads of consultation on this. Um, there are so many contributors that it's an exciting story, but it's one that everybody needs to sort of turn around and slap their self on the back for, including you, Mark. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that have been so passionate about the city. This couldn't be ha this wouldn't be happening if there wasn't so much confidence in investment within the city, which is great. And then you know, I was joking around earlier. You know, there's there are huge opportunities left in the city, and we are really looking forward to working more people here. But there just aren't those big regeneration spaces left anymore for someone to sort of come along and work with us in a partnership. But there's huge opportunity uh, for people to move into the tech quarter, which of course phase two of this is within. Um, um, the um, New King's Court complex. So that's that is it's so exciting. There's a lot of office space in there. It's 125,000 square feet of office. There's I think something 9,000 square feet for a gym. Yeah. There's you know there's very very speculative obviously a four star hotel as well. I mean yeah. here we are in COVID looking ahead. I mean will people go back to the offices, which I was alluding to, to with Joe earlier. Well, we work with some incredible partners on this. So one of them is Reef. Da, da, da. I mean, they're an amazing company. Um, and uh, the space has been specifically designed so it can be changed without any significant change, if that makes sense. So that office space you're talking about has been designed so that it can go to residential if it needs to. And in phase one, we've done exactly the same thing. I say we, the royal we, I'm not trying to take any credit for that aspect of it. Um, so that space has also been designed so that it can adjust. We're not looking at any aspect of this, whether it be retail, um, residential or standard office space, where it needs to be fixed in stone. Fixed in stone. The liquidity is, is, is the essential thing here because we need to be able to be fluid about this. We need to be able to react with the market. And that's not with a sort of 12 ball shotgun aspect to it, just sort of shooting at everything and hoping we catch something. There's very much a plan, but we know that we need to be ready to adjust. You know, this city's got two, well, over 2000 years of history. You know, the reason it's still here is that it has managed to evolve. It sits on a floodplain. So even we, um, from a sort of uh, regeneration point of view and any, any development that takes place in the city, my advice to anyone would be, make sure your space is flexible so that you can go one way or the other. Um, and if you look at high streets where that's working or has tended to work, look at the outskirts of Bath where you've got retail areas there where they still look like a Georgian shop front and but one minute it will be a two-bedroom lovely flat and the next minute it's it's a you know pottery 
that's so important. Brighton is another fantastic example that's been doing this since the 1970s. It's not a new way of working, but it's one that I think larger places generally don't adopt. Um, with regard to, there are lots of things that people are looking at at the moment and saying, well, you know, how can you have made that decision? You know, how do you know this is going to be right? We've got some of the best property experts in the entire country working for the city council. We've got 50 listed contractors, 25 of which that are they're also bidding for contracts with at the moment that sit in the top 50 companies within their industry in the entire country. You know, people forget that Gloucester is the capital of the county and people are looking at us finally again and saying, do you know something? I want a little piece of that. So okay. it's great. Dawn, it's very, very exciting, as you know. And yes, the punchline is, is obviously going to support it and keep an eye on it at the same time, obviously. Uh, one thing I would like to say, one thing I would like to say is so important that we use local contractors. I'm not going to get into it now, but as many local businesses, regional businesses as possible, it's so important that that money stays here within the city. Right, we're just going to go quickly through stories that have caught your eye on punchline, that's okay. So I'm going to zip around. Uh, very, very quickly. Uh, Joe, what's caught your eye and punchline this week? Um, yeah, well, just very quickly, uh, it picks up on the whole thing about accelerated change. And I think it also picks up on, on, on King's Court and what Dawn's just talked about. I think the one thing that caught my eye is that we're seeing a changing job market right now as part of this accelerated change. Um, and I think we're looking at what the future, you know, what future careers there may be for everybody as, as old careers kind of dip, maybe disappear or or reduce. Um, and as a parent as well, I'm looking at, you know, what does the future look like for my kids, not just socially, but also, you know, in terms of the workplace. And I think the, you covered the new video released by the Golden Valley um, development, which I think is so important. And it, it's a brilliant video, uh, which covers the future opportunities from this growing um, cyber sector. And, and of course, Cyber Central being at, at the heart of that. And I think, you know, Cyber Central puts Gloucestershire at the heart of cyber, not just regionally, not just nationally, but internationally. And I think that's incredibly exciting. And it underpins so much of the future growth and development in Gloucester and Gloucestershire, including King's Quarter. So, you know, that, that's, that's really important, I think, along with the great news about King's Quarter this week. Um, and also, as you pointed out and covered, also a very diverse and inclusive sector, which I think is so important. Okay, thanks very much, Joe. Mark, what have you got? What have you picked up for the stories of Punchline this week? Just to follow on to my earlier story, really, and it was around the fact that um, Debenhams is closing six of its stores. Um, however, luckily, it's not going to be uh, the one in Gloucester. Whew, thank goodness for that. Well, fingers crossed. Let's be honest, it is on borrowed time. Thanks, Mark. John, what have you picked up from the Punchline this week? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm at the risk of repeating the 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 the, the Dutch mega trawler um, thing. Um, the, the, for me, the, the cyber centre and the uh, uh, and in fact, what Dawn's just said about um, the space being set aside in, in the new development for um, you know for tech. Um, yeah, that is, yeah, yeah. I, I know all of us who live in Gloucestershire have have uh, our own business and know um, just how much really high quality stuff is done in this county. Um, you know, from from the aviation side to to, to, to you know to to, to well to, you know, to Renishaw to whatever the county as a whole, but the you know this um, this cyber thing is huge. And, and in it, with another hat on, I'm the honorary consul for Estonia, you know, the first nation to suffer suffer a state based cyber attack at a government level, and um, obviously they're quite good at it now. Um, and and yeah, it, it, it's massive. It is just massive. It is the the, the innovation. Um, you know, uh, the, the future proofing, yeah, and you know, it's exciting. And uh, so, uh, at the risk of, um, um, of of joining the bandwagon, um, um, yep, that's great. Okay, thanks very much, John. Dawn, wrapping up. What's the story that's caught your eye in punchline this week? Um, I think my main one was probably um, the fact that the King, you know, obviously King's Quarter, so that was very, very exciting. Um, but I, I completely um, agree with John. I think that there's a huge opportunity here at the moment. You had so many incredible stories this week. It was hard for me. You had one about Gloucester City Airport. As you know, I'm appointed by the council to sit on the board there. For, I have been for the last four and a half years. Um, yeah, and John's right. There's, there's so much stuff. But you know something, Mark, it's really important important with the media there's a balance and you have a really good balance with your news stories um 
it's not all doom and gloom out there. And, you know, I'm really pleased that somebody like you has actually got this balance going on. So you can, you need to be truthful. We need to know exactly what the truth is because you know, the hardest pills to swallow are the ones we sometimes need. But at the same time, where there's good stuff to report and great things happening, you know, crack on it. It's, it's fantastic. My answer to your question, there's some great stories here. It's too hard to choose. Thank you very much, Dawn. And thanks ever so much for the kind words. I'm loving you even more. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to my panel. Please be safe out there. That's the end of this week's Punchline Talks. Cheerio.